and it's my honor and my pleasure to welcome you to the first live gathering of Book Mania in four years. Can you believe we were last together in person in 2019? Today is something to celebrate, and while we are very grateful that we were able to bring you hybrid programming thanks to virtual forums such as Zoom, I for one, and I'm sure all of you feel the same way, have learned a new appreciation for being in person and interacting with human beings who share a common love, the love of reading and the love of learning. I hope you will join me in thanking the Library Foundation of Martin County for funding this free festival and the Martin County Library System for bringing these amazing authors here to Martin County. Let's give them a round of applause, please. It is great to be back at Jensen Beach High School. We do have, yes, I'm so excited. I really am so excited. I hope you can feel that. I've been looking forward to this for so long. So now I'm ready to introduce our first panel. Our first panel is Florida Nonfiction. This panel is moderated by Peggy Chittam. Peggy and her husband have been to every continent except Antarctica. And I know a few people in here have been to Antarctica, so they could hook Peggy up. Um, they love to travel. She has a national parks passport with many stamps in it. They love music, and they have season tickets to the Atlantic Classical Orchestra. And the Atlantic Classical Orchestra has very close ties to the library, and Peggy suggests that you check out the free concerts that are at the library from ACO. Peggy is addicted to the New York Times Daily Crossword Puzzle. She enjoys cooking, baking, and dining out at our wonderful area restaurants. Peggy will introduce her authors, who are Clay Henderson and James Clark, but for now, please welcome Peggy Chittam. Good morning. Thank you all for being here nice and early. And I can tell you, after reading the books by our two authors, Florida Literary Luminaries by Jim Clark, right here, and Forces of Nature by Clay Henderson, who is over here with the bow tie, you will be fascinated by what they have to say. Clay, um, has been in positions where he's been the executive director of the Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience at Stetson University, from which he is now retired. But he's been active in Florida Nature Conservancy and preserving our lands for a long time. And I'll leave you to, to read most of the details of his biography in your program. But I do want to point out that he is the recipient of the, natural, uh, the National Public Service Award from the Nature Conservancy, which my husband and I are proud members of down here, and also the Bill Sadowski Memorial Award from the Environmental and Land Use Section of the Florida Bar. So he's got quite a distinguished background. And since he now lives up in Virginia, I asked him, well, how did you get so involved in Florida issues? And he said he came by it naturally because he's a sixth generation Floridian whose grandmother was born in a log cabin. You don't get more Florida than that. Jim uh, Clark, on the other hand, is a distinguished senior lecturer at the University of Central Florida. He's um, written many histories of Florida and has been a journalist and has quite a distinguished writing career and is also the recipient of a number of journalistic awards. He's also quite the character, and as I told him, when he asked me where his $5,000 check was that I was supposed to give him for doing this, that I could not stop interrupting my husband when I was reading his Florida Literary Luminaries book because there are so many fascinating little factoids in here, things I did not know about Florida or writers connected with Florida. When I was first given this assignment, I thought, how could I bring these two seemingly unrelated subjects together? But as I began to read both of their books, 
There is so much crossover between what these two authors have to say. It's quite amazing. But I would like to start with a question for um, both Jim and for Clay, based on something <clears throat> that Jim wrote to me when we were corresponding before this. Uh, in an email, he said to me, what fascinates me is that most people, particularly in your area, and he's talking about the Treasure Coast, are from somewhere else. Back in the day, they took New York history or New Jersey history and don't know about Florida's rich history and the fantastic places around them. And since I'm a New Englander myself, I know that that's true, and that's probably true of a number of you in the audience, that you're not from here. So I thought that I would ask them a question to kick off things that bring in both of the aspects of what they're writing about. Case in point, my husband and I uh, attend church in Tequesta, and we drive down Route 1. And in a few miles of each other, we pass the Nat Reed Nature Center, which used to be the Hope Sound Nature Preserve. And we also pass Jonathan Dickinson State Park. People probably drive by those all the time and have no idea who either of those people are. So I'm going to ask them to tell us briefly why these places are named after these men, what they did to deserve that honor. So Jim, I'd like to start with you since Jonathan Dickinson is older. Yeah. <laughs> He probably and, knew Jonathan and, personally. And I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan Dixon, uh, Dr. Dickinson, people don't realize the first international bestseller <laughs> takes place right here uh, in 1696. Uh, Jonathan Dickinson was the uh, a merchant from Philadelphia, a leading Quaker, and his ship wrecked over here. And uh, he had to, he and his party walked up the coast. They were captured by the Hobi Indians and uh, subjected to, to horrors. And uh, when he got back finally to Philadelphia, several of them died, uh, he wrote uh, what became uh, the first international bestseller uh, that was translated into a number of languages and uh, also became uh, the first of a, of a genre which uh, went into the 1880s, which was the Indian captive genre. Uh, novels and true stories were written about people captured by the Indians, children raised by the Indians, things like that. So Jonathan Dixon, Dickinson, I don't know why I'm doing that, uh, is, uh, is a very famous author. In fact, somebody mentioned his book is still for sale at the Elliott Museum. Mm -hmm and available at the Martin County Library System. So if you check it out for yourself. I wonder if our books will still be around 300 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> and Clay, I yeah. wanted to ask you about Nat Reed. Sure, oh yeah. Who, who, who here knew Nat Reed? Okay, there are a few wow. hands, all right, wow. there are a few hands that went up. Um, Nat's uh, family developed Jupiter Island. Uh, they had a few dollars in their pocket. Um, Nat went off the Air Force, came back, and said, wow, things are changing here in Florida, and got really interested and involved in trying to think what he could do about protecting the environment. Uh, a guy uh, from down the road, Palm Beach, uh, Claude Kirk, uh, was first Republican in 100 years to be elected governor of Florida. He was a real character. And uh, he calls Nat and said, you know, you want to do something about the environment? How about coming with me to Tallahassee? And so uh, he agreed to uh, go to Tallahassee uh, to work for the sum of a dollar a year. He didn't need the money. And uh, was Florida's first environmental advisor at a time before there was even a Department of Environmental Regulation, any of that stuff. He, in that role, he played a, a key role in uh, killing the, uh, the jet port that would have just ruined the Everglades. Uh, the development or the protection of Biscayne Bay, uh, Big Cypress National Preserve, helped kill the Cross Florida Barge Canal. Uh, Kirk only served one term, 
Uh, he was quite a flamboyant guy. Didn't quite didn't have the popularity to get reelected. Nixon uh, had become president. Uh, Nixon and and uh, uh, Kirk were good good buddies. Um, Nixon called. What can you you know? Can anything I can do for you? He said, Well, you know, why don't you take Nat Reed to Washington? And so Nat became the Assistant Secretary of Interior in 1970. And for those of us that in the environmental law business, or perhaps for years, this was the golden age. You know, in that short period of time that Nat was there, uh, Congress passed the Environmental Protection Act, created the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the uh, Endangered Species Act. And Nat was right in the middle of every piece of that including the protection of the Alaska wilderness, which like double the size of the national park system. Um, so he was in the middle of all of that, came back to Florida, served several terms on the uh, South Florida Water Management District, uh, primarily uh, um, working on um, Everglades issues, and worked all the way to the time of his death. I knew Nat very well. We worked on a lot of stuff together. He would sneak away to Canada, uh, the only place he could get any, any rest, and that's where he would fish for salmon. As soon as he would cross the border and get a cell signal, he'd call me, all right, what's going on? What are we going to do about this? Well, you know, on and on and on. It was the kind of work that we did together. Um, a few years back on his last trip, went up there, crossed over to uh, Quebec to do a little bit of fishing. Uh, he, uh, he caught this an absolutely wonderful uh, salmon that was like this big, you know, the last picture in his camera is of Nat smiling, holding this salmon. And, um, uh, and he says, if I die today, you know, it, it will be, have been a great life. It was a special day. And uh, a few minutes later, he slipped, hit his head on a rock, and those were his last words. And if there was a Mount Rushmore of environmental icons in Florida, uh, he would he would be one of them, and he's your local product, and everybody in the state of Florida that believes and supports and loves Florida's environment knows Martin County because of Nat Reed. Yep, J Jupiter Island native. So. Um, Jim, I know that your specialty is history, and uh, I know that you talk about newcomers not knowing much about it. What would you recommend a uh, few titles for newcomers to help broaden their knowledge, other than your own books oh, of Florida oh, history, yeah. which Tomorrow. I would recommend. This is a good and, one here, too, by the way, Jim. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it goes without saying that these my, two books are My book on is the list. easier to carry, though. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's uh, true. Yeah. You know, a, a book that I think that it's fiction, actually, that I think probably. Uh, captures Florida best, and I, I will bet you he will agree with me, is a book called A Land Remembered. Sure. Yeah. Uh, by, and I, have you, anybody read A Land Remembered? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. There you go. I am. <laughs> it probably captures mm -hmm. the, it's a fiction, but probably uh, captures the uh, 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 Florida better than any single book I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent recommendation. Um, Clay, I know that you've worked in the late era of uh, land conservation, but I was amazed when I read your book about what a role ladies' fashion played in kicking off Nature Conservancy here in Florida. It was actually the fad for feathers in women's hats mm -hmm. that got things going. So could you talk yeah. about that a little, please? Yeah, this is, um, uh, you know, we're now in happy April Fool, everybody. So last, last month was Women's History Month. <laughs> so I had, I had a chance to answer this question a few times. Women played an important role uh, in early conservation movement. And of course, what's interesting about that is that they didn't have the right to vote at that time, but they still played this important role. Um, it, in the late 1800s, the, the fashion craze was uh, uh, big long feathers and ladies' hats, uh, particularly uh, roseate spoonbills and egrets and herons. 
and in a 10-year period of time, 90% of the wading birds in Florida were, were killed. Um, it was it just, it just, it happened in a blink of an eye. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, on his way to uh, Cuba and San Juan Hill in history, was stationed at uh, Tampa Bay for a little while. And what he, he observed, it was just unbelievable to him, that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of dead birds heaped on the docks being ready to be shipped back to New York uh, for the fashion industry. So it was women who actually rebelled against this, realizing that it was women who was driving this market to, uh, to uh, kill off the birds. It was some grand dames in Massachusetts that first started the Massachusetts Audubon Society. They were, they would, they came, some of them came to Florida. Uh, Clara Domerich and Laura Mars, uh, and Mary Monroe uh, were the founders of Florida Audubon Society in 1900. Uh, and they worked to pass laws to be able to, to stop that. Uh, the, this was, we had no game wardens at the time, so the, the, the newly found Florida Audubon Society hired uh, several uh, wardens to uh, go out and try to protect these rookeries. Uh, two of them, Columbus McLeod and Guy Bradley, were murdered. Uh, they never found McLeod's body. Uh, Bradley, uh, they found him uh, you know, in his boat with a shot to his head. Uh, last month for the 75th, or December rather, in the 75th anniversary of uh, Everglades National Park, they named the new visitor center, Guy Bradley's honor. Um, but then women didn't stop there. And just, just briefly, the May Man Jennings uh, was the first lady of Florida. Her, governor, her husband was the governor. Uh, after they left the governor's mansion, she became the president of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs and she worked to acquire uh, Royal Palm Hammock. So when you go into Everglades National Park, the, that's what the first thing you do is go in that beautiful area of Everglades. This, this was the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs uh, that made that happen. And so um, uh, all of this, as I said before, took place before any of them had the right to vote. But they made a tremendous impact uh, on Florida, protected the wading birds from being extinct, and uh, we all owe them a great debt of gratitude. It really kicked off the Nature Conservancy movement in Florida, so it, that was a real eye-opener for me. And talking about eye-openers, Jim, I got such a kick out of reading your book in um, Florida Luminaries. There were people that I really expected to be in here. Um, everybody read A Land Remembered, and people think of uh, Carl Hyacin and uh, maybe Tim Dorsey, if you're a fan of his. I happen to be, because when I read one of his books and he talks about sites around Florida, we'll go out and my husband and I will do a field trip to uh, see what he's talked about in his book, which I think is really fun. But I know that there were surprises in here. I didn't associate Harriet Beecher Stowe or Robert Frost with Florida. We lived right down the street from his farm in Derry for years, and I never knew he was associated with Florida. Did you find any surprising things about Floridian writers when you were researching your book, Jim? Yeah, I, I found, uh, you're talking about uh, Frost, um, kind of a, a tragic story. He first comes to Florida and, uh, uh, is, and buys a house in Gainesville and puts down a deposit. And he and his wife were staying in an apartment while they house hunted. And uh, so they put down a deposit, they were getting ready to close on the house and his, uh, his wife fell down a flight of stairs and died. And after that, he didn't want any part of Gainesville. <laughs> and so he moved to uh, South Florida. He hated Key West. He couldn't stand uh, Key West. And he ended up in, uh, in Coral Gables. Um, and uh, I thought it was ironic that, uh, that he was asked by John Kennedy to write a poem for Kennedy's inauguration in 1961. And Kennedy was in Palm Beach writing the inaugural while Robert Frost was in Coral Gables writing the poem uh, for the inauguration. But there 
uh, all these people that you just don't associate with Florida, uh, uh, who lived in Key West, Tennessee Williams. Uh, uh, in fact, Tennessee Williams, uh, and I've never seen this movie. I don't know if anybody has a movie called The Rose Tattoo. Oh, okay. Uh, which won several Academy Awards, uh, and it's set in Mississippi, but Tennessee Williams, who wrote it, insisted it be filmed in Key West. Uh, so uh, lots of, of strange things that brought authors to, uh, to Florida and really made it kind of a, of a literary, uh, literary center. It's, it's true. I mean, I mentioned um, Tim Dorsey as being one of my favorites, but of course there, uh, Zora Neale Thurston, mm -hmm. who's finally getting some recognition for her work uh, up in Fort Pierce. There is her um, heritage trail that you can go and visit if you would like to. Um, all of the contemporary writers, Ernest Hemingway, that's another person that I really, I think of him with Cuba, but I don't really, and I think of him in Key West, but I didn't realize that he was in Key West at the time of the hurricane that destroyed Flagless Railroad. Yes, um, he was there uh, when this horrendous hurricane came through in, what, 1935 and uh, killed hundreds of people. And uh, it struck mostly in the northern Keys and it killed a number of workers working on the, uh, working on the railroad uh, who were government people, who were World War I veterans, uh, who had been left over, frankly, from the Bonus Army. Uh, some of them who couldn't quite fit in to society uh, were hired for this. And uh, one of the most scathing pieces uh, Hemingway ever wrote uh, was a magazine piece about how he blamed Roosevelt, but how the government had caused their deaths, that they didn't send a train, the weather forecasting was terrible, and let these hundreds of uh, people die. Uh, and it's one of his most dramatic pieces, and very few people have read it. I, I was only aware of the story because I'd read Les Standiford's The Lost Train to yes. Paradise, which Excellent book. It, it really goes into that whole background of how that whole fiasco happened. I will, I will tell one Hemingway story, uh, and I will tell you two stories, uh, and you can pick your version, uh, and one is very famous that while Hemingway was in uh, uh, Spain, uh, his wife tore down the boxing rings he had arranged uh, or built in the backyard and installed a swimming pool. And uh, when he came back, he was angry and he yelled and screamed at her. And the story is that he threw a penny down and said, here, take my last penny. And if you go there, the penny is still in the concrete. Okay, that's version one, uh, and uh, version two is, while he was in Spain, his wife found out he was having an affair with Martha Gellhorn, who became his fourth wife, and in a fit of anger, she tore down his boxing ring in the backyard and built a swimming pool. <laughs> so you can pick your version. <laughs> yeah, but, well, um, just, uh, you know, we've got we to talk about Hemingway, just one real quick. Uh, I've been to the, you know, after he left Key West, he and Gellhorn went moved to Havana, and I've been to his house, uh, La Finca, outside Havana. What's interesting from a writer's point of view, I mean, he, had, he left it in a hurry after the Cuban Revolution, so it's exactly how he left it with the magazines on the table, but there are 3,000 books in that house. And he was a voracious reader, as you can imagine. Every one of those books is all marked up with all kinds of notes and interlineation. And there are scholars now from Harvard that are poring over those books to try to get, you know, inside of, of his head. You know, what was he thinking, and how did this contribute to his work? Amazing. Yeah. Well, I had had the chance to chat a little bit more with Clay yesterday because. Jim's GPS system <laughs> did him wrong on uh, trying to arrive here yesterday. Yeah, East Ocean doesn't exist on his GPS, so who knows? But I asked 
Clay, if he could uh, tell me what his favorite conservation spot in all of Florida, what was his favorite park or preserve? Um, because Florida has a very highly rated, if not the most highly rated, state park system in the entire country. You have no idea how fortunate you are to live here in many ways. And Clay said, well, that's like asking who my favorite child is. So, <laughs> right. Clay, I'll ask you to talk about a, a few of your favorite spots here in I, Florida. Oh, uh, you know, and, and these are possibly places you've never been to or uh, maybe not even heard of. Uh, one that I, I would say is kind of like my children uh, in my own backyard, Spruce Creek Preserve. I worked on that one for 25 years. Now that's how many marriages have lasted past that, you know. It, it is, uh, you know, it was, we had to piece it together just a little bit at a time. There are thousand year old Indian mounds that are on the site. Uh, the site where uh, early colonial attempts were there from Turnbull, it's fascinating. But that one I worked on the longest. Um, one that I never did not work on that um, I'm still in awe of is Fakahatchee Strand. And uh, I, I feel a kinship to it. First of all, Fakahatchee is in the western part of the Everglades. It is a true swamp. It is like the Amazon in terms of the, where the royal palms. You know, we take the royal palms here for granted. This is the one place where they grow wild and naturally. Um, uh, there was a book written about fact, the, the orchid thief that was made into a movie adaptation, if that rings a bell with anybody. We had a hurricane hit the other, a few years back, direct hit over there, lots of flooding. We were at Corkscrew, and I said, you know what, this is, this is going to be a chance. Let's go panther hunting. And we went down into Fakahatchee Strand, and there's an old tram road where they, where they brought the, the, the cypress out, and it's the only high spot. For, for miles and miles around. And we navigated down this tram road around 10 and 12 foot alligators who wouldn't get out of the way. And we just kept going and then bam, we knew it, it happened. Cats are cats. Cats hate water. And so the panther was out on the road. He, this was a real panther, not, you know, not a UFO and just walk, walked along. He kept looking back behind me. I got pictures of him. Um, I got out of the car to take pictures. He jumped back in the water. You know, He didn't like the water, jumped back out on the thing. So we got really, really good looks at him. And that, that's one of just the magical moments you know, that I've had. But Fakahatchee Strand, it's protected, is the largest state park in Florida because of the obsession of a guy named Mel Finn, who was a lawyer in Miami who hated practicing law, fell in love with the orchids at Fakahatchee, uh, was one of the founders of the Nature Conservancy in Florida, and spent his life trying to protect that, and it's now Florida's largest state park. Last place, place that probably no one's been to or heard of, about 400 miles from here is uh, Topsail Hill State Preserve. It's called topsail because the, the white, pure white sand dunes are so tall that from 10 miles out at sea, it would look like the tops of sailboats. Um, and when I was a kid in the panhandle, we'd stop at the grocery store and we'd get a couple of big boxes and we'd turn them into sleds and we could sled down those, those uh, sand those that were so big. So. Um, the last time I was there was with two of my buddies who have now since passed. Uh, uh, John Hankinson maybe protected about 300,000 acres of Florida. Uh, his last assignment was doing restoration work after Deepwater Horizon. But the other one of my heroes, and the heroes in the book, is George Wilson. George Wilson protected over a million and a half acres in Florida working for the Nature Conservancy. That beach, Top Sales Preserve, uh, had been uh, purchased by some developers. Uh, it went, they, they were uh, charged with fraud. Uh, it went belly up. The property ended up you know, having to be sold on the courthouse steps of a little sleepy town called Defuniac Springs. And George Wilson bought that beautiful beach, the most beautiful beach in Florida, on the courthouse steps in a foreclosure sale. And now, uh, every year when the, the, the who's the who's put out the best beaches in the world, 
uh, what they call Great Nyland State Beach and Top Sail Hill State Preserve is always on that list as one of the best beaches in the world. Wow. That's amazing when you think about it. Uh, I thought you were also possibly going to mention the, um, the Oak Preserve oh. that John Quincy Adams started. I mean, going way, way back in Florida I, history. Well, I can do that because I'll give credit to Jim. I, Jim wrote a story for Florida Magazine, I think, about 30 years ago <laughs> called Florida's First Environmentalist, and it was about John Quincy Adams. Think about that. And, um, and this, he, um, he, what he did is that he protected about a 5,000 acre parcel near Pensacola, near the brand new Pensacola Naval Air Station, or what na went air, naval, naval base then, um, because it had the largest stand of white, pine, white oak and live oak, which at that time everyone understood was impenetrable to cannonballs. If you go to Boston Harbor and you see USS Constitution, the oldest ship in the United States Navy, called Old Ironsides because the cannonballs bounced off of it, it was made of wood from the panhandle of Florida, of this preserve. And it is still, it is now part of Gulf Islands National Seashore. I have visited it, it twice since it had direct hits from hurricanes. And there may be a few limbs down, but they've withstood all those hurricanes for now over 200 years. Amazing place. I grew up in the Boston area, and I cannot tell you how many times that I'd been aboard Old Ironsides. We used to go there all the time because my parent, my, my mother was a teacher, so we went everywhere. And I never, ever knew the Florida connection to Old Ironsides. So that was a, that was a big reveal in the, the book for me. Now, I just got a question from one of our listeners that I was going to ask you, so I'll ask it for her, and I'll address it to you, Jim. Um, what is your writing process? You're still an active academic, so how do you work that into your daily process? Yeah, I, well, as I've gotten older, it's a much slower process, <laughs> but um, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, if you love writing and if any of you want to be writers, this is the, this is kind of the golden age of writing uh, in terms of book publishers. Uh, there are, you know, they're the big five, but there are more small publishers than there have ever been uh, because of uh, technology. Uh, you can do limited runs. Uh, of, you know, I have, I have a book that came out in the 90s and uh, my son wanted a couple copies, and I didn't have them. And I called the publisher, and they said, well, we're out, but we're going back for another press run. And when it first came out, a second press run was yeah. a 1,000 copies. And I said, wow. And I was flattered. And I said, how many copies? And they said, 36. <laughs> and so, kind of a downer. But, you know, it, uh, it's fun to write. It's fun, especially in Florida. Uh, Clay and I have talked about this, that uh, so many things have never been written about. So many of the stories you're hearing today you've never heard uh, before. And so it's, it's kind of a fun thing, but if you aspire to, to be a writer, uh, you can publish your book online uh, and, and have it sold through Amazon. So, uh, you know, this is just a great time to be writing. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, Clay, I'm going to address this one to you. What is the biggest environmental threat that Florida faces? Oh, gosh. <laughs> and who is at the forefront? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, in, we're at a historic juncture right now. Uh, Florida is now growing at the fastest rate that it has ever grown. And, and my, when I was born, Florida had 3.7 million people. The population of the state now is six times that. So I've watched that happen in my lifetime. Um, you know, talking to some of you t yesterday and last night, you know, talk about changes you've seen here in Martin County in 20 years. Um, it, it's just extraordinary. Uh, everything is driven by this rate of growth. Uh, our stress on the water supplies, fresh water supplies, 
um, overcrowding, um, the, the pollution issues, the, the things you've witnessed here, the algae blooms, the end river lagoon, result of a lot of runoff. We've got a quarter million septic tanks up, all up and down the Indian River Lagoon. Um, the biggest uh, threat to wildlife in this uh, state is, uh, is loss of habitat. Every year we're bulldozing about 100,000 acres uh, of land. Um, you know, and, and you, you see it, you know, you, there's a nice forest or a nice marsh and, you know, they clear cut everything, put in the cookie cutter houses and bring in exotic vegetation and call it landscaping. So it's a, this is, this is the, this is the, it drives everything else. And so when you couple that with everybody wanting to live on the coast, uh, 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 sea level rise, uh, climate change, the incredible intensity of hurricanes that we've seen in the last, last few years all be, are all compounded uh, by this. Uh, who is in the forefront? I mean, we've got some outstanding conservation organizations in the state. Uh, uh, I mentioned uh, both Nature Conservancy and Florida Audubon Society are very much involved in, in this. Uh, state government, you know, is, runs kind of hot and gold. We, we talk a lot in, in the book about land conservation. It's, it's generally been a nonpartisan issue. We've had both strong support from Democrat and Republican governors for uh, land conservation, uh, but the legislature has just really been, you know, just frankly behind the eight ball the last few years. Are they far more interested in making it easier to develop than, than to conserve what we, what we need to. So uh, next time you see a, uh, a legislator out there, feel free to bend their ear and say, we've, we've really we've got to get back to doing a little bit more to protect this special place uh, that we love. Yeah, one of the things that strikes me is how uneven it is around the state that, well, we have 67 counties, and some have adopted really strong mm -hmm. pro-environmental plans, and others have said, come on in and just turn their county over to developers, which they're going to rue one day. Yeah. The next question I'm going to address to both of you. What is the most shocking thing that you discovered during research <laughs> for your books? <laughs> I, 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 you know, there, we think, you know, sort of like how bad could it be? And um, I don't, you, you know, been down to Miami. Miami is a beautiful city. Biscayne National, Biscayne National Park is just a gem. You know that the beauty of the, of that bay. But uh, but what it what could have been? Just think about this. What could have been? There were uh, people who had bought up all the islands in Biscayne Bay and wanted to turn them all into another Fisher Island. And then there was a guy who at that moment in time was the richest person in the world, n number one on the Fortune 500 list, and he wanted to turn Biscayne Bay into the world's, the hemisphere's largest oil refinery and deep water uh, oil port. He wanted to be able to move oil and gas out of Biscayne Bay to service the entire uh, Western Hemisphere. And no surprise, the Dade County Commission thought this was the greatest idea that could be. And, but a couple things happened. There were some women that got involved, you know, like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Juanita Green. Um, there were some fishermen who said, we've, we can't do this, and we've got to put a stop to it. Um, and then there's a great story that, that Ken Burns and his story on the national parks uh, unearthed. That was just a wonderful story. Um, Lancelot Jones, his father was an enslaved person who moved to Florida after the Civil War. They bought this, a homestead at this island in Biscayne Bay, and they needed to basically buy the island and bulldoze it to be able to put in the oil refinery. And the richest man in the world offered them gazillions and gazillions of dollars to make this happen. And Lancelot, who at this point was a, a fishing guide, said, no, we're not selling. And he was such a good fishing guide that people that you've heard of, like Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, Herb, even Herbert Hoover, all liked to go fish with Lancelot Jones. And so he would whisper in their ear, don't you think this needs to be a national park? Well, today it is. And the first person to, to sell the property to the federal government for the national park was Lancelot Jones. 
And if you ever visit the visitor center, you go down a road called Lancelot Jones Way. That's amazing. Uh, I think the biggest shock I had was uh, a story out of Pensacola that there was a man from uh, Boston who was a ship's captain, and he, he went between Pensacola and uh, uh, Boston. And once when he was in Pensacola, uh, uh, some slaves approached him and said, hey, can you sneak us out and uh, get us to freedom? And uh, he said, okay. And so they got in the boat and a uh, big ship and sailed and the ship was becalmed. There was no breeze and so it stopped in the Gulf and the slave catchers uh, uh, caught up with him and he was charged federally uh, with, with slave stealing and his, this is a federal court ordered by a federal judge. Uh, his punishment was that his hand was branded with an S, with a hot iron, for slave stealer. That this was the punishment in Florida to have your hand branded. And it became a poem uh, by uh, Longfellow and uh, uh, swept the North even before uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, Uncle Tom and was one of the rallying cries uh, beginning in the 1840s for anti-slavery. Again, it's wow. an amazing story. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, and again, I'll address it to both of you. What is your favorite book to read just for pleasure? Jim, do you look like you uh, want to go first? Well, I already mentioned uh, Smith's uh, book, A Land Remembered. Uh, gosh, uh, you know, I don't read as much as I, I like to. We were talking at our table last night at dinner about our, our favorite authors. Uh, uh, Rick Atkinson has written a bunch of uh, World War II books, and uh, those are great if you've never read his uh, trilogy, and he's now doing American Revolution books. Uh, there are just so many great books out there, it's, uh, it's hard. And again, there are so many books set in Florida that you would, uh, you would love to read. Uh, 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 Hemingway's, uh, you know, uh, To Have and Have Not is set in the Florida Keys. Um, and people who wrote books, uh, 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 F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote Tender is the Night in St. Pete Beach. So lots of books out there about Florida and written in Florida. I, I, um, I go back all the time to two books um, that made a great impact. Uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Everglades River of Grass, 1947. It's what helped bring about Everglades National Park. It's an incredible poetic style, but it's also a history book. And she had great access to the Native uh, Americans, uh, Seminoles, and learned a lot of stories and wrote down things that had not been written down before. And that's just, it's a great book, so obviously still in print. And the other one I keep going back to is uh, William Bartram, 1773. I actually have a second edition printed in London um, because it is an accurate snapshot of the flora and fauna and wildlife and native people who lived here at that time. And as we try to redesign, rewild, uh, manage these conservation lands to what it was like before we impacted them. We need to know exactly what was here before, and so it becomes a great roadmap for that. So there's a, that's a, there are not too many, you know, 250 year old books about Florida that are still in print, but that's one of them. Yeah, I, uh, to follow up on that, I think people don't realize what Florida was like, yeah. and uh, Audubon and Bartram both write about this, and I, I have hard times imagining this. Um, I think it's Audubon who writes yeah. about the sky turning black yeah. with birds. Millions of birds would block out the sun. And uh, those of you, I don't know, has anybody ever seen the Miami River? Uh, it's not much to see anymore. It's kind of a sludge area. But it once had rapids. Rapids. Like you would find in Colorado or western North Carolina. You could, you know, shoot the rapids. And now it's nothing. So we've already lost so much here. Well, um, our time is almost up, and I, I just wanted to say that I think 
that an author has done his or her job if he or she impels the reader to go out and learn more about what they've read, to see something, cook something if it's a cookbook, to visit places, to learn more about the writer himself. And I think the two of you have succeeded admirably in both of your books because my to-read list has grown enormously. And I now have a much longer a list of places that I want to go and visit. Um, I've already been on to my husband about making reservations for a state park that's up in the north part of the, the state because I haven't been there. And um, I think that you two have just done a wonderful job of stimulating it. And I hope you've done that for the audience today. Thank you, Thank you very much for being with us.